So this is the uh, full moon night of January, first full moon of the new year, 2007, and the Sangha has reflected on their training rules, the Padimokas and so forth, that part of the monastic uh, convention, the moral, ethical foundation that we establish, and then the uh, Pavana, the development or cultivation of the path. And so, during the, on Sunday, we, Sunday evening, we enter the three month winter retreat, the annual three month retreat, three months during the English winter of total silence, and meditation. But how does that affect your mind? <coughs> Some people say, oh, wonderful, you know. That. Other people say, oh, God, I don't know if I'll be able to get through one month. But the point, the point of it is, is to be aware of whatever, you know, we're not interested in, in kind of marathon meditations or endurance contests, but in, uh, so it's not to test out, you know, test you out and see who can, they quiet the longest, sit the longest, and bear with three months of English winter in total silence. And that's that's the hard line. <clears throat> the point is awakened attention. So if you just if you think you're just going to grin and bear it and really, you know, try to get enlightened during the next three months or solve all your problems or or you're going to fear that you might just crack up, fall apart. Uh, be aware of that. Be aware of your own, the way we grasp just perceptions. Because right now, what is this? A retreat, winter, three months winter retreat. What is the reality of that in the here and now? Words, isn't it? Concepts. And then you, you have, most of you have memories of being on retreats and uh, so that the word retreat and then uh, uh, three months, three months seems like a long time to many people and so forth. So this is a way of reflecting on just how the power of concepts and words, how they affect us. Or tones of voice, you know, if I take a really stern uh, dead serious kind of attitude, you know, hard master, meditation master approach, you know, whip you summon us into enlightenment. And if any of you drop dead, we just push your body outside and <laughs> we won't even have take time to chant Kusla Dhamma for you. Now I'm making you laugh, but what if I said that in all seriousness? Then, then just notice how, you know, that, that we want a, another three months of conviviality, because conviviality is a pleasant word, isn't it? Convivial means friendly and kind of, you know, it, it doesn't have that austere, hard line to it. Three months of friendliness and metta and love and and uh, bliss. 
And so these words, you know, are positive words, and and if you know if I say them in the right inspiring way, then you will feel inspired. And this is just to, to observe how the human mind, you know, what being human is. You know, we we have this language, we have language, we have concepts, and the positive negatives, positives and negatives, and then they, you know, they affect us like this. You know, negative concept or a negative innuendo or a tone of voice or whatever is like this. A positive, inspiring, happy, beautiful, uh, refined is, you feel like this. We can be vulgar and coarse or terribly refined or <coughs> very proper samanas, only using poly terms to express our deepest feelings. <laughs> so they're ideals, you know, we have ideals of, uh, and this is a very idealistic, and, you know, most of us enter monasticism out of idealism. So we expect a lot from it, you know, where do we want, want that? We want some supportive convention, something that, that we can trust, something that will uh, never disappoint us or never let us down. And of course, this is where the the emphasis uh, the Buddha made on mindfulness, because it's only a convention. Now, convention, when I use this word, it means it's it's like it's a conditioned state, like uh, dumb. Uh, what we call the scriptural dhamma vinya is all convention. Buddhism is a convention, Theravada Buddhism, Mahayana Buddhism, oh, it could have Tibetan Buddhism, it's all conventions. It is, they have forms, they have qualities. Uh, the religious conventions, you know, whether they're Buddhist or Christian or Muslim or whatever, they just to point out what a convention is, so that you begin to see it in terms of what it is, rather than just let the the convention kind of lead you into a state of glee or elation or doubt or aversion or anger. Now this is very important because, you know, our emotional worlds, we, we're in these sensitive forms, living in this sense realm. So the human experience, being human, as I've, you've heard me say many times, is the experience of Sensitivity, and sensitivity is like this, you feel everything. It's about continuous, unrelenting feeling. The only way you can get away from it sometimes is falling into sleep. And yesterday I, I took a nap and had this strange dream that you were all adoring some false monk who was pouring furniture polish all over you. And I was trying to <laughs> now what the meaning of that is. <laughs> but sensitivity is, you know, this is why in um, Satipatthana, you you know, Vedana Nupasana Satipatthana, Vedana is looking into sensitivity. What is sensitivity? Ayatana, uh, six six senses and things like this. It's so obviously, you know, stated in the in the Satipatthana Sutta, and and then to to observe sensitivity, not just try to suppress it or or only have uh, you know try to seek situations where you only have pleasant sensory impingement, because the world that we live in, you know, it, it's uh, this planet Earth that we live on, and uh, you know it's. Uh, it is a beautiful planet, and it has much beauty and uh, to it. And be as sensi sensitivity implies the, the very positive, the refined, the the bliss, the beautiful. But also, it means it's opposite: hell and misery and despair and ugliness, brutality, uh, torture, 
cruelty on the very, you know, the other end, coarse cruelty, brutality, and then the, all the various shades of feeling in between. Now, this is just reflecting on the way it is. It's not a judgment. So in knowing the world as it is, it's, it's, it's a, the Buddha is inviting us to look at the world as we experience it not in terms of ideas of it, of, you know, of what the world is as, as a perception or, a, or some kind of viewpoint, but recognize when we talk about the world, it's this, here and now, this, this body, this, this sensitivity. This is the, the world I, that I experience. You know, whatever part of the world I'm in, I'm experiencing it from this from this sensitive state, from the limitations of this form. And so this is called reflection and observing the way it is. So it's like waking up, uh, investigating, looking into. So in, because uh, recognizing the, what sensitivity is, we're not trying to to, uh, you know, kind of avoid it or become insensitive or think that that we've got to live only in the positive sides of sensitivity. We've got to seek special, refined, concentrated states where we can stay in, uh, in yogic bliss for, uh, you know, hours or days or months. Because then, you know, we, we develop a, a longing for, for special, for that which is very fine, that which is rare. But in mindfulness meditation, you know, mindfulness is the, is the path to the deathless, is the way to liberation, not, not through attachment to refined positive states or creations in consciousness, but to let go of any control, of any preference, of any condition, and be the knower of the way it is. And then we get into vipassana. All conditions are impermanent. All dhamma is not, not self. So in terms of a clear statement, clear teaching, I don't think you can do better than that. It's pretty direct and... and uh, practical, no, you don't need special equipment or, you know, high technology. In fact, Buddhist monasticism was based on low technology. You know, they give you an alms bowl, shave your head, and wear rags. You know, you don't get any kind of, even though nowadays you get laptops. And But these are the the problems we face in in modern affluent uh, situations. But these needn't be problems either, because the point is not to 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 attach to any view, but to whatever view that you that you are attached you to recognize it is a view. An attachment is like this: an opinion a preference, a prejudice, uh, a concept, whatever it is, you know, an attachment to it, what happens? And just knowing for myself, and examining my own experience uh, through consciousness, is you know, whatever I attach to, I become like that. So, you know, this, so this uh, sense of becoming, you know, if I, if I start thinking negatively, uh, I don't like this, I don't like that, and I don't want this, uh, I become negative. My personality always kind of stays on that level of grumpy complaining. And so then I'd watch myself, you know, because uh, when you're very idealistic like I was, you, there's a lot to complain about wherever you go. Because you, you want life to be always more than what it is, you know. And uh, and everywhere you go, you never quite, you know, you can always see something you don't like about it. 
and complain. So I developed, you know, and in the, I was in the Navy for four years. Four years in the American Navy. I came out what they, you know, con a completely addicted to what is vulgarly referred to in naval jargon in the United States, bitching. This is the way we talked in the Navy, in the bitching about everything. Now, I remember, you know, we'd go over, we'd, you know, go to San Francisco and they'd start complaining about San Francisco. We'd go over to, to Sasebo and they'd complain about that. In Hong Kong, they'd complain about Hong Kong, they'd complain about this, complain about that, complain about the food, complain about the ship, the Navy, the government, the captain. And you get together and complain. And so my four years of, of, I wasn't that way before, but after four years of sitting on rusting old warships complaining, I was addicted. <laughs> it's taken me a long time to get out of the habit because, it, you know, those kind of habits are, you know, once you become an, an addict, it's hard to get get out of it. But then the thing that got me out of it was observing it, not just trying to shut up, not complain about anything and be awfully nice and understanding and sweet and try to put on a, you know, a nice mask of, uh, of a good boy. I love everybody feeling. But in terms of recognizing the result with complaining, this continual grumpy complaining is made, made me feel depressed. You know, so you, you, you get kind of stuck, you get locked into gloomy states. And, uh, and then, the, and this is where the first noble truth comes in, suffering, dukkha. So, you know, why do I suffer so much? So I start reflecting, you know, start observing, rather than just complaining because life, myself, the society I'm in, the world I live in, the people I live with, are not what I think they should be. But I suddenly recognize that, that you know, this is, this is the way the world is. There's beauty, there's ugly, there's... Uh, good, bad, there's fairness, there's unfairness, there's uh, happiness, there's misery, and on and on like this. Well, if you've got one, you've got the other. You've got happiness, you're going to have unhappiness. So trying to be happy or attain happiness through controlling, through trying to control everything to make you feel happy, will lead to unhappiness because you'll inevitably fail, you know, it's just, uh, you know, you can kind of delude yourself for a while and then it'll fall apart, it'll disappoint you. Notice how when you form attachments to teachers or monks or nuns or whatever, you know, we want them to be perfect, you know, never let us down, always be wise and compassionate for us. And then we inevitably let you down. So, so, a couple of weeks ago at tea time, lay people, I one, one of the lay people was asking me about uh, trusting. She wanted to know if she could trust me. And so I said, no way can you trust me. <laughs> I'm not asking anybody to trust me. Because I'm not pointing at myself. You know, I'm not, I don't want you to trust me, in other words. But, you, you know, if you're going to trust, trust in awareness of the moment. This is, this is the refuge, when we take refuge. An awakened consciousness. In yourself, not in, you know, Ajahn Sumato will always be there for me and never let me down. 
Well, I've always let you down in so many ways. I'm never quite what you've always wanted your teacher to be, have I? <laughs> and uh, uh, and when you do expect, you know, you're it's set up for disillusionment. So in this world of changing conditions, you know, recognize that conditions, you can't trust, you can trust the fact that they'll change. That's what. You know, whatever you think, whatever you feel, uh, whatever place you're in, uh, people you're living with, the thing you can know is, that, will I always? Will they always be there for me? Will always? Will will I always feel safe and secure here? Will life? Will you promise to to make me feel this uh, safety uh, all my whole life and? God, nobody can promise that and keep it because conditioned phenomena is is changing so you you know in changing from from the ignorant state of self view we we see change in terms of dhamma the refuge in dhamma all conditions are impermanent the base ankarani cha well, that's not something to grasp. You, know, you can easily quote, all conditions are impermanent. Uh, and that can be just, you know, another opinion we, we grasp. And that's not what is recommended. Not grasping Buddhist views, but taking those teachings and proving them. And to prove, to see, to recognize impermanent and whatever you don't need to go over you just look at yourself the way the way you know how things affect you how a sunny day sunny warm day or a cold rainy day that has an effect on we feel it don't we you can't help but feel the weather and it, and it has a different effect you know it's easier to be happy feel happy on a warm sunny day isn't it because the conditions for happiness are there. Sunshine, warmth, blue sky, spring flowers, green grass. It's all pretty, beautiful. And the conditions for, and this, these, these are what bring happiness. Beauty, warmth. And then, it, then suddenly it'll turn cold and, and it'll be winter time and and harsh winds blowing, and and it damp, and and uh, cloudy gray skies. And how do you feel? You can observe. It's different than on a sunny day. Now we can complain, you know, English weather, oh, you know, like we do. Good at complaining about the weather. But the weather is just the way it is, you know. So wanting English weather to be like Hawaii is a waste of time, isn't it? It's just never going to be that way, no matter how much you want it to be. So you, you, you know, the the obvious thing is to learn from the way it is. You don't have to go to Hawaii because then you'll find something there you won't like. It's too damp there. Things get moldy and they stink. When you're in Hawaii, I lived in Hawaii. It's full of foul odors, <laughs> rotting fruit, and things like that, and things mold, get you know, get very moldy. So sensitivity then is uh, is is the state we're in, where we have to bear with sensitivity till till the body dies. And that, that, you know, then as you get older too, you know, you're, uh, you don't have the, the youthful vigor. You know, like now I'm feeling stiffer, lack of energy, things like this, due to old age. I don't have that kind of zip I used to have when we were in Egypt last month, climbing Mount Sinai. Oh, God. I used to love climbing mountains like that, you know. I've climbed, 
I've climbed Mount Kinabalu, Mauna Loa. I've climbed Crow Patrick, <laughs> the Pyrenees. Um, all kinds of mountains. In the Alps, the Italian Alps, Swiss Alps. <laughs> And uh, on and on like that, I've climbed uh, um, Glastonbury Tor. <laughs> Adam's Peak. <laughs> and then Mount Sinai. And, I think, and um, Kailash, Mount Kailash in Tibet. So I think, you know, I suddenly realize I'm too old. I don't have the, I don't have that thing that gets you up mountains anymore. And they don't admit old age, tomato, you know, you, you, you're still young, you know, the people trying to cheer me up. <laughs> but they don't have to feel what 73 years old is like, you know, 73 year old body is not the same as a 40 or 50, not to mention a 20 or 30. It's like this. And at least this body is like this. Well, they, one could complain about it or is that more just recognize it's like this. It's all right. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with old age or stiff joints or anything like that. You know, it's better we you don't know, like not to have sicknesses and lack of energy and stiff joints. But if that's what we get, if that's what we're experiencing, then awareness of it, it's like this. And what I'm pointing to is this awareness that we say embraces, that allows things to be what they are, without, you know, saying how it should be. Now we're so conditioned to, to, to want to put something onto it, to add, to make some comment or give it some value, a value judgment of some sort. But, during this winter retreat, I encourage you to train yourselves. Don't judge anything, you know. Accept the flow in whatever way you're experiencing it, both physically, emotionally, mentally. And this is an attitude then of awareness, sati sampachanya, in which you, you're not trying to get anything or get rid of anything or become anything, but if you are, if you are determined to get something or become something or get rid of things, be the knower of that. What's it like to be someone trying to become or somebody trying to get rid of something you don't like and that you're experiencing? You know, so you become, you're, you're, you're noticing the way it is. You're awakening to Dhamma. And, and you're awakening to the truth of the way it is. So the word Dhamma, you know, translated as best we can into English, the truth of the way it is. Then this word Dhamma is, is uh, you know, we have Kusla Dhamma, Kusla Dhamma, all kinds of Dhammas, and Amata Dhamma. So, and in, in awareness is the way that we, the, from this amata dhamma, or the deathless, the unconditioned, unconditioned reality, pure conscious awareness, then we have perspective on kusla dhamma, akusla dhamma, apiya, kada, dhamma, the, the different dhammas. Good, bad, right, wrong, so forth. So this is why when we say the path to the deathless, mindfulness, path to the deathless, apamado matapadang. Apamado is uh, being paying attention, being aware, being awake, is, to, is the path to the deathless, so amatapadang. It's as simple as that. It's not that I am become, some, you know, somebody who's, who won't die. Because those are words again. I'm somebody you know, I, if I'm mindful, I will become somebody that won't die. It's rubbish. <laughs> That's another delusion if I attach to it. 
I don't want to die, I want to reach the deathless, is still, you know, the conventional, the, the, you know, the conventional form of language and thought. So instead of, of, of identity or grasping or thinking, you're letting go of all that. Grasping, letting go of grasping, of thinking, letting go of feeling, which no, not suppressing, but allowing feeling to be what it is, whether, whatever feeling it might be. So it's this, this attitude of a patient attention, relaxed attention, a sense of listening, open, allowing, receiving. Now when we aren't that way, then we are in the state of becoming because we're trying to, you know, we go back into our conditioned <coughs> habits. Now my conditioned habits, speaking from my experience, because that's what I know, you know, I don't know, maybe you're different. I'm, so I'm not saying you have to experience things like me, but these are more examples of, uh, you know, when I become a person, I have to attach to being, being, uh, I have to name Lung Pao Sumedho. I can become Lung Pao Sumedho for you. Or uh, you can say, Ajahn, I'm a teacher. I'm a teacher, and or I'm a, a Chao Kun in Thailand. That means something. I'm I'm a high-ranking monk, and uh, I'm just an ordinary guy. I'm just like any of you. I'm nothing special. Still, still uh, a person, isn't it? An identity of some sort. Whether you want to make yourself the best or the worst or ordinary or special. That's all concept again. You have to think to do that. To create yourself, you have to think, I am a Buddhist monk. I am Ajahn Sumedho. But if I stop thinking and just awareness, attentiveness, you know, then I have perspective. If the if uh, the thought I'm Ajahn Sumedho comes up, I see it for what it is. It's a it's a thought in mind. It begins and ends. It's a sankara, a rising ceasing. So then there's nothing to think about that other than reflect. You know, all sankaras are impermanent. So so then then we don't have to define or or find ourselves in any form or any quality or any condition. Because we are this pure amata dhamma, deathless reality. You know, this is when, when we when we recognize this and rest in it and trust it. That's why I say it's the only thing you can trust. That which is trustworthy is this refuge in awareness. So I warn you not to trust anything, any condition any system, any convention, any teacher. But don't distrust them either. That's the opposite. But examine them. How do you how do you use this Buddhist convention? You know, how how to use it skillfully so it, its purpose, the purpose of the Buddhist convention is for realizing truth, for liberation from death, from delusion, from ignorance. And so Grasping the convention won't, you know, isn't going to do it. You know, it'll still be, you know, you still will, when the time comes, be, you know, it will fail you. The convention will fail you. So, the, because it's not meant to, to be a refuge. It's not meant to, to be what you rely on, the, the convention. But the convention is here in order to help us see, pointing to this here and now reality of consciousness that we're all experiencing. So, nothing special about it. I don't have to practice in a cave for 25 years to know this, or do anything special, but just suddenly wake up 
pay attention in the terms of awareness, not in terms of theory, ideas, uh, philosophical systems, religious systems, grasping any of those, and even though they, how profound they might be intellectually, the grasping of any convention will inevitably fail you, disappoint you, because you're grasping something that is changing. That that is that can't be a refuge. So just to take you know, reflect on what I'm saying, to uh, you know to to it's like to encourage you to awakenness, to recognition of it, and to cultivating it. Like this is a lifetime path, you know, from now till death of the body is uh, you know because our karma ripens in the present. So you you know, you can't you know, if things change, people come and go, people love you and hate you. Everything is wonderful, everything is horrible, fair and unfair and so forth. This is like the weather. Everything is changing. And then our karma is a you know, we whether we're happy or sad or threatened or frightened or joyful or glad or feel secure or insecure, whatever we're feeling. Our relationship to the feeling is knowing it is like this. It is what it is. And then when I say it is what it is, it's, a, it's just re of receiving it because as soon as you say, this is a, a bad thought, then it becomes more than that, isn't it? You're putting a value judgment onto it, even if it is a bad thought. So, but if, if a bad thought comes into your mind, consciousness, it's like this. Bad thoughts are like this. Anger is like this. Despair. And in this way, you know, you can actually let go. And, and, and You know, I found through this, that this is why mindfulness now is, the, is you know, becoming increasingly appreciated in the Western world. You know, they're finding you know, in psychotherapy and they're finding uh, how important mindfulness is. Because if we can't, if we, you know, just trying to to change the mask or, or you know, trying to um, think positively or endlessly think about ourselves of how we, sh how we need to become like this or get rid of that or resolve this this trauma, or work out of relationships with our families, and and uh, on and on like that. There's no end to it, you know. No matter what your relationships are, or your emotional problems, or your character, or personality, don't make a problem about it. But see it in terms of what it is in the present. It's like this. So this is the shortcut, actually. Shortcut to Nibbana. Somebody asked me once, you know, because they, they were coming to meditation workshops here and they are finding it a bit difficult. They said, Ajahn Sumedha, is there any shortcuts? I said, yeah. What is it? I said, I'm doing it. <laughs> this is a shortcut. <laughs> and he said, I was afraid you'd say that. <laughs> But no, like what I'm saying right now, observe what your mind's doing. Like, you know, this, it brings up, well, what about the scriptures say this, and this teacher says this, and you've got to purify this, and you've got to get your sila right, and you've got to, you know, get your jhanas and your samadhi, and then you, you know, and it, and, you know, you've got to do all these things. And you know, it's just not like waking up and being here. It sounds, <laughs> can't do it. You know, I've got... I've got all these things to develop and cultivate and get and achieve and 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 the scriptures say this and the teacher says that and now listen, that's all thinking again, isn't it? Those are views and opinions. Those are ideas you get. You know, you you've heard this, or you know, famous masters have said this or told you this, or you've read all the the great, the holy books of every religion, and they fill you with ideas. 
Fair enough. But now, say, during this winter, it's a chance to not not to not to get rid of it or to disparage it, but to recognize in the present, you know, your own doubt about this or about what's going on here at Amravati or about your own ability or your own views about what you need for practice are like this. You know, they, they are what they are. So I'm not asking you to kind of, you shouldn't have any views or opinions or, you know, trying to, to kind of convert you to, to my philosophy. <laughs> But it's meant to be as an encouragement to to begin to very directly recognize, see the way it is, and to to learn from yourself the way you are, you know your own kind of obsessions or or views and opinions and biases, uh, uh, attachments. We learn from that. We learn from our attachments, from our opinion from our fears and desires. This is learning the nature of all conditions are impermanent. All Dhamma is not self. So the the world is like this right now. You know, whatever you're feeling, thinking, the world's like this. Now then, that when I do this, when I reflect and I say the world is like this, what I'm doing is I'm just kind of accepting it in in terms of the way I'm experiencing it now. It's like this. It's not a kind of resignation, a kind of fatalism, saying it's permanently like this. But it is. Right now, the way I feel, the emotional state and the so forth is like this. And as I are willing to to kind of receive the world the way it is right now, I'm aware of it. It it changes. That's starting from the here and now, being aware. You know, I can't can't keep the feeling I have about you know in some kind of permanent state. You're aware that that which is aware of change. That is the path to the deathless. That is, you know, so, and the path to the deathless and awareness aren't two things. So it's a, you know, it gets down to this ultimate simplicity of awareness is the deathless itself. So they say, apamado amatabadang, awareness path to the deathless, pamado matu no padang, heedlessness, not being aware, is like always dying. Pamado matu no padang, being heedless and unaware and, and, and inattentive is like, you know, that's why we're frightened, because we're always dying. We're always a part of us dying and we feel this loss and, and sense of change that we can't control and and dread about the future because you know you, you don't know what's going to happen and as long as we get lost in that then it's pomado heedlessness not being aware is the path to the to pa, is the path to death and then the third verse is apamado namianti apamadno apamad Apamado Namiyanti is never dying. It's like never dying. It's deathless. And ye pamadaya tamadana. But heed, heedlessness is like dying every moment. You know, that's why in affluent societies like we live in, you know, people suffer a lot because, you know, it's something about our lives, no matter how comfortable or secure they might be. There's something totally unsatisfying about it. You know, there's something missing because we're always caught in the death, in this death, this realm of death. We're attached to death. We've bound ourselves to the death realm, 
to the sankharas, to the changing, it's without knowing what we're doing. We're helpless victims, lost in the death realm, the sankhara. So it's not getting rid of sankhara, but awakening. Appamado amatapadang, appamado namiyanti. So it's like, like it's as simple as that. It's recognizing what, what, that is awareness, attentiveness to the present, and then trusting it. Now you know I totally trust this, completely trustworthy. But don't take my word for it. <laughs> Because you have to find out yourself. And say, Ajahn Sumedho told me. <laughs> uh, that's all right, but it won't. Well, how much good is it going to do you unless you do it? Unless you find out. So, my eating strawberry ice cream means that you still don't quite know what, what flavor it is until you taste it. <laughs> So I offer this as a reflection and uh, 